Do you want to hear a story about $20 million worth of maple syrup being stolen? Will you give a few seconds of your time? Good evening, folks. Kennedy, we have died. The atomic power plant in the city of Kiev was damaged. How do you measure such an astonishing moment in history? The energy crisis who were gathered in South Africa and Connecticut today. Do you want to hear my story? All right, so for this story, I feel like you need to have a little bit of backstory because when you hear $20 million worth of maple syrup being stolen, I don't know if anybody would understand the context of that. I think definitely backstory is needed in that situation. So in Canada, or more specifically in Quebec, there's a, a federation. It's called the Federation of Quebec Maple Syrup Producers. Um, they started like 50 years ago and it was basically, I mean, now it's referred to as a cartel. That's kind of like the informal reference. Everyone kind of refers to it as a cartel. And I looked up what is the exact meaning of a cartel because I thought, all right, everyone automatically thinks of Mexican drug cartels. But a car- <laughs> <That's>, <laughs> cartel is usually linked to the word drugs. Yes. Yeah. A cartel is defined as an association of manufacturers or suppliers with the purchase of maintaining prices at a high level and restricting competition. Yep, I think I've heard that before. Yeah, so again, you know, also loosely connected to like a monopoly, for example. That's right, cartel behaviour. So there's the Federation, and throughout this story, it's easy for me just to refer to them as the Federation, but they are the Federation of Quebec Maple Syrup Producers. Um and I found, I found it interesting because I don't know any... Prior to doing this story, I don't know anything about Canada or very little other than that they produce maple syrup. Yeah, and, they're Americans, but they're un- unarmed. Yeah, but they're also very, very close to us in the Commonwealth. That's true. Um, so, Quebec is roughly three times the size of Texas. And another interesting fact that I found, because also maple syrup relies on fresh water um they have one of the world's largest reserves of fresh water they've got over a million lakes throughout quebec yeah i didn't know that no so the federation is responsible for close to 94 percent of canada's syrup and 77 percent of the world syrup supply wow uh, again, again, you just don't think of it. You don't. No. We all, uh, we've all been into the shop. I don't know about you, but you go to the shop. You've got your fake maple syrup, mm-hmm. and then you've got and then you've got the really expensive mm-hmm. Canadian maple syrup. Yeah, I always get that one. Yeah, I think you have to. Yeah, that's right. Otherwise, you're just not doing it properly. No, no. So the federation is in place. It's been in place for about fifty years, and and over the years they've kind of had small changes made, and I think. The Federation, as we know it today, kind of kicked off around 1989, where they mm-hmm. put their agreement in place. And that agreement, ba- like the the baseline of it is basically that all the sap in Canada belongs to the Federation. <laughs> okay. So if you're a maple syrup producer, farmer, because it literally is farmed out of the maple the trees. trees. Yep. You've got, to, you've got to abide by these rules that the regulations set if you're in Quebec, which again, Quebec is you know the biggest supplier of maple syrup for the world. Mm-hmm. If you're one of these producers, you've essentially got one customer to sell to, the Federation, or you know whoever they deem approved. <laughs> right. <laughs> you know. And this is all legal, right? This is all Th- legal. This is all legal. It's all above board. Um, as with anything of this type of situation there's a lot of people anti-federation yep um and the federation is it's often compared to something again i was not familiar with until doing this story um have you ever heard of the organization opec i have heard the name but i couldn't tell you in a pinch what it means or who they are and, and any of that 
So they're the organization of petroleum exporting countries. Okay. With the mission, mission statement, again, I think it's important, of coordinating and unifying petroleum policies of its member countries and ensuring stabilization of oil markets. Hmm. Very, very similar. So again, I had no idea prior to doing this that there was this whole maple syrup world in Canada. I mean, I know that they make it. I know it's a big part. I know you just thought it was just like peanut butter or Vegemite or, or any, any other conserve that's been made around the world. Exactly. But mm. I think it's important to remember that, you know, it's, it's like it's deemed an insult in Canada to try and serve this fake maple syrup. Like they take it really <laughs> seriously. It's part of their culture. It's, it's literally everywhere. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the maple leaf is it's on their flag. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and again, things I didn't know. So the Federation, it's involved in outside of just setting prices and approving suppliers and, and people to sell to. They've got like this whole thing set up, like a whole marketing promotional plan where they'll host competitions. They do a ton of work in Japan and obviously in the States. They'll do like free maple syrup tastings and they have professional chefs um, come in and compete with coming out with new recipes and all of that type of gear. Mm -hmm. They've got whole things put in place to spread the awareness of maple syrup and how Quebec's kind of exporting it and everything that they've got in place. Like there was a huge, huge news when the Federation had deals with Tokyo Disney World and the theme parks to literally convince Japanese people to purchase it, consume it, and infiltrate the Japanese market for maple syrup. Mm -hmm. So it's all, like it's a whole thing. 50 years worth of history and they've got nothing but moving forward. How do we continue to dominate the world with maple syrup and all of that type of gear? Um, here's another really interesting thing that I think is worth knowing when we talk about how much was stolen in this story. So an average barrel it's about 600 pounds worth of maple syrup at the point in this story was worth about $1,200 which is roughly 20 times what oil was worth and now it's kind of it's worth close to $1,800 per barrel Jesus so it's a pretty it's a pretty big thing obviously no one uh, funnily enough no one's ever gone to war over maple syrup well again that was you know I was thinking about it when I was writing the story and doing all the research there's so much fun kind of poked at it because mm -hmm. it's maple syrup. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, It's not, you know, when we talk about this <laughs> You big put it heist, on pancakes. <laughs> yeah, when we talk about this big heist, we're not talking about cocaine or a bank being robbed, <laughs> armored trucks being robbed or something like that. It's, it's literally maple syrup. So it's not like the first 10 minutes of the movie Heat? No. It's, no. it's maple syrup. I feel if yeah. there ever was a movie, it would be all like, it would be hard to make this, you know, a dark and dirty, you know, crime thriller heist. It's going to be... It'd probably be a comedy, wouldn't it? I was about to say, it has to be a comedy. Yeah. Um, so again, part of the Federation, again, have you have to understand this to, to get the story. They've got all of these reserves set up, which are basically warehouses. It's called the Strategic or the Global Strategic Maple Syrup Reserve. Okay. Because a part of their role in maple syrup distribution is controlling the the supply, which in return right. controls the price. That's so right. if you're a producer, you've got your little maple syrup shack set up somewhere and you've got all your trees tapped, you've got to apply to the Federation to essentially get a license and then they give you a quota of how much you're allowed to produce for that for that season. Oh, really? So, it is a fixed market if you're a producer. You can't be... You can't say, right, I'm going to go and start a business producing maple syrup and then, you know, go and go crazy on quantities because you're only allowed to farm, produce X amount. And anything that's over-farmed or over-produced is then stored at these reserves, which are just big warehouses out in like little country towns in in Quebec. So wait, 
there's an a, there's a limit on how much you're allowed to produce, and if you produce over, it gets stored. But does a person who produces that still get paid for the overproduction? Or that's another crucial part of the story. So they okay. do, but not until it's sold. Oh right, okay. So you Jeez. could overproduce. You could do the work today, and you might not actually see any payment on it for another. Could be three months. Could be three years. Jesus. Yep. So they've got all these reserves set up. I think right now they've got five or six big warehouses and they hold a ton. Look, well, they hold literally anywhere from 100 to $140 million worth of maple syrup at any point in these reserves. Mm-hmm. So little, little, like little, little factories, all pristine. Again, I feel it's very Canadian because they're all... They're not like dirty warehouses that you would imagine when you think of like oil or something else that's being traded and all that type of gear. These are like pristine warehouses with these immaculate white baby blue barrels all stacked up in rows, all filled with maple syrup. Mm -hmm. So yeah, we've got all these reserves spread out across and they had... There was, a, there was an issue, I suppose you would say, in 2007-2008 seri- uh, season when the reserve basically ran dry. Okay. I wonder what was going on back then. Well, there's been a... I think once you, when you look at the history of the, the, the Federation, there's been quite a few up and down moments where the anti-Federation members you know, come up in arms and saying, this is why we don't need it. And then next year they kind of fix it. And the pro federation members are all like, this is why we have it because they run things for us. They make sure that we're always in business. Mm. But anyways, they ran fit. They basically ran out of syrup. So they had to go out and release a ton extra licenses to start recouping their reserves because the goal is to always have syrup in reserve. Yep which then meant they had to go out and get more space. And that's kind of where the story really kicks off. So now we've got an understanding of how this reserve works. They're basically there to set the price. They deal with distributors. They have their approved list list of people that you can sell syrup to. They set how much you're allowed to farm or produce at any given point. And then it's up to you just to basically follow their rules. Mm. So it's roughly 2010, 2011, they go out and they lease multiple new warehouses across Quebec. I think it's pronounced Quebec. I don't think it's Quebec, but anyway. Is whatever. it Quebec? Yeah, it's pretty, yeah. And I'm not sure that really matters, but... Okay, should we start yeah. again? No, <laughs> <laughs> definitely, definitely not. Also, it's not really important, but I've been to Quebec as well. Oh, okay, well, you would know. Yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah that was the, all I saw was maple syrup. <laughs> are you, are you going to edit this part out? Definitely not. <laughs> Definitely not. <laughs> um, all right, so Quebec. Um, so, yeah, it's roughly 2011 now, um, 2010, 2011, and they've got an oversupply again. So they go, and, they go and lease out all these new warehouses so they can start storing their federal reserve of maple syrup. And it's one, one of the warehouses is owned by the wife of this guy, his name's Avic Caron, and he ends up basically spearheading the heist, and I think... So it's an inside job, technically. Kind of, but it really is... Um, what's that saying? You know, a thief is born out of opportunity or something like that? Yep, sounds about right. And that's literally what it is. He's He's kind of... A little bit of backstory on him is he's kind of... You know, this guy kind of has a little bit of a shady past. He's had dealings with the Montreal Mafia and he's got a bit of a criminal record and all of that type of gear. Mm. So he sees, basically, he's got the keys to the bank vault. He's ready to he's ready to rock and roll. He comes up with the idea of, if I can find someone to buy this, this is literally liquid gold. Yep. Literally. Literally. It's worth mm. a ton of money and these reserves are like guarded by one guy <laughs> is it Ricky Gervais from um, uh, Night at the Museum P- 
pretty much i mean for, <laughs> for such a huge operation from everything i can find out it's it's fairly low-key like they store it there it's not head of operations it's not part of their big office space or warehouse it's just a random warehouse out in the countryside filled with tons and tons and tons and barrels of maple syrup sounds very canadian they only do an audit of the um the warehouses once a year really yep which is how this heist this this plan kind of all came to a very quick end because if you imagine again super clean warehouse all stacked together with barrels white barrels baby blue barrels like i picture it and it's just like this perfect little warehouse um interesting fact about maple syrup is it doesn't create condensation you know that's that would make sense yeah so no barrels ever get rusty okay yeah so the one the one time a year that the auditor goes out to audit this particular warehouse apparently it's common practice that they'll climb all over the the barrels because they're all 600 pound barrels they're going nowhere and he gets Mm -hmm. to the top And he starts finding all these empty barrels. He starts finding all these rusty barrels. Um, And then he starts finding all these damaged barrels. Because again, in true Canadian form, they've got special forklifts to handle these barrels so they don't damage them. Are we jumping ahead? Or or has this audit taken place soon after or soon before the heist? Because I'm thinking in my head, if they're only going to be auditing these barrels once a year... The smart thing to do would be wait until the audit's just been completed, then go you do your heist, and then you you got a year to get away. I'm just giving you like a prelude as to how it all falls apart because okay, that, cool. Just so you understand how these these warehouses work, there. Yeah. Because you're the imagine you're the guy who's you're going to pull off this heist. You're not gonna mm-hmm. you're not gonna go out and rob a bank where there's all security and stuff like that. No, the, the, these warehouses are, are hardly occupied they're hardly monitored they've got one or two security guards and probably the last thing on these security guards minds is someone's going to come and steal the maple syrup that's right because because basically this federation has been moving people into line oh you could pretty much say by fear who's going to have the ball exactly so it's really just a and it's canada they don't do heists Again, I mean, this does go on to be one of Canada's biggest crimes and biggest crime investigations in their history. <laughs> yeah, right, okay. So everything about this story is, like, super Canadian. Okay. Um, and these orders take place, and that, that's how they ultimately got, un- like, that's how they ultimately got found out is because the auditor found all these barrels beaten up, filled with water, empty, and totally out of place. Yeah. The reason I tell you that now is so you can understand how, in my opinion, easy it would be to get away with this if you had half a brain. Well, that's why my brain was already going down that road. Yep. Uh, So you've got all these rusty barrels, damaged, empty, um, all out of place. And that's kind of the undoing of of these guys. But I think let's go back to the beginning of um, how they kind of got together and how they decided to pull off canada's greatest maple syrup heist um you've got two main guys like i said you've got this guy a vic and he's really a nobody he's not doing anything he's, he's definitely not involved in maple syrup he's like i said just a it's a product of opportunity for him his wife happens to own a warehouse that happens to get leased out by the reserve um and they had a small part of that warehouse that they did business out of as well so he's there all the time just looking at all this syrup all this potential income (laughs) dollar signs in his eyes dollar signs in his eyes Um, and then you've got this other guy and i don't know if i should try and pronounce his last name but his first name's richard i think it's like valerie or something valerie's or something like that richie Um, v richie v and he's got i think is a really cool job they refer to him as a barrel roller (laughs) that that sounds cool already (laughs) i want to sign up for that because he has basically been involved in in the syrup industry most of his life but he works you know on the black market the shady side of things you know he's like the go-to guy when you don't want to deal with the federation 
So he's got all the hookups on how to get around. You know, if you want to overproduce maple syrup, you go to Richie and he organizes the the people that will buy it for you. The funny thing is all of this syrup, stolen syrup, black market syrup, it all, we could have eaten it. Mm-hmm. Yep. It all, like the ultimate goal is to get it on the store, in, into the stores, onto the shelves. That's like, it's like anything else. Like, you know, the ultimate goal of cocaine is to get it up people's noses, right? I know, but with cocaine, it's, you know, it's so far out of reality for a lot of people, but maple mm-hmm. syrup, it's like... Mm-hmm. You just put just, it on your pancakes. To stop and think that you're walking down the aisle of the supermarket and mm-hmm. that maple syrup could have been... That could have come through the black market. That could have been stolen syrup, you know. That, that could call that the black label stuff. They, there's actually a marketing idea somewhere out there for someone who wants to take it up. But it is, it's risky business. I'm not That's advocating right. that you get into the maple syrup heist industry. <laughs> Definitely not. Definitely uh, not. So, they, so there's, a, there's a third guy. So there's only... Throughout this investigation, there was over, just for a little bit of context, over 200 interviews conducted... 40 search warrants and there was close to 20 arrests little guys that you know just got arrested charged not ended up in jail or anything like that scenery yeah but the story really revolves around these four guys which is a vic richard the truck driver sebastian who was the connection between these two so a vic is at the warehouse every day he gets friendly with this guy sebastian who's just a truck driver for the Federation. He's there to pick up syrup and drop it off to where he's told to drop it off. Mm-hmm. But through his dealing, he's well aware of this guy, Richard. So Vic approaches Sebastian and says, listen, I'm going to steal this syrup and I want you to help me find someone who can sell it on the black market, basically. So they do. They connect. All three of them are in it now. They've got a little shack down on the lake again. So Canadian. It's down on this little lake somewhere. It's a little maple syrup shack where they load up the stolen syrup. They take it down to their shack. They empty it. They fill up their own barrels. Straight from the lake, they fill up the old reserve, uh, the old Federation barrels, take them back, put them away. No one's the wiser for a little bit of time. Again, it's totally Canadian. You're down in a little fishing shack or something. You're filling up your stolen barrels with lake water and you're dropping them off. So they don't know anything. I guess they don't have the foresight to think of the barrels are going to rust with damaged some barrels, whatever, whatever. Again, again, this is Canada. Yeah, I guess they're not great at breeding Heist. criminals. No, <laughs> there's not a lot of famous Canadian criminals, is there? No. Yeah. Um. So it's it's these three guys um, basically working together. They've all kind of got their specialty. Vic's got access. He's got the key cards. He's got the keys to the warehouse because it's his wife's warehouse. Sebastian can provide the truck and he also knows Richard and then Richard's got the contacts to go ahead and get it out of Quebec and send it off into the rest of the world. Where's the fourth guy... He's got an extremely difficult name to pronounce. Um, We've got to give him a nickname then. I think if we just call him... Um, he He's basically the like the supplier. He's the... His name is... I can't even... It's Etienne Saint Perrier or something like that. Saint Pierre. Saint Pierre. Mm. So we'll call him St. Pierre. So he, he operates out of New Brunswick, which is outside of the Federation's control. So he's technically not doing anything wrong at this point until he catches up with these guys. But it's also said later that he dealt with a ton of black market uh, maple syrup and he really had this attitude of um, the Federation can go and F themselves. And he was quite vocal in writing letters and Um, getting on the radio and being on the TV about the Federation, you know, anti-Federation, that type of thing. So so it definitely didn't help his defence at a later date when he tried to just plead total ignorance. I didn't know that that was stolen syrup. Oh, God. So you've got these four guys. um, The last one, St. Perrier, he's in there and he is responsible. Like, he distributes to the, the USA, Japan, most of Europe and even down to Australia. Yeah. And his job was taking the black market syrup that these guys are stealing and putting it in the hands of legitimate sellers. And that's what Mm -hmm. continues to blow my mind 
is that it's not it's so hard to attach the idea of these guys being criminals and this heist together because it's syrup and they're just <laughs> it's maple syrup they're just trying to get it into shopping centers mm. you know they're just trying to get mm. it into supermarkets that's right um, I mean, yes, they're probably trying to make some money for themselves, but that's not the oh, end, yeah. the total end game. Hundred percent, they're 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 in it to make money, and they all make a ton of money. But the 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 like the direction they've got to head in is getting it just into your everyday supermarket, so you can, so sure. us everyday folk can just go and shop for yeah. maple syrup. Yeah, and it worked really well for a really well. They I think they were successful for about nine months. And they ended up taking just over 9,500 barrels worth of the stuff. Jeez. So if you work that out, you know, 100 barrels a month type of thing, they're in there, they're doing it, they've worked it all out. And I think that was probably their undoing as well because it was so easy to do. Like anybody. How much did you say a barrel's worth, Josh? At the point of this story, $1,200. I'm just doing the quick math. That's uh, twelve million dollars. Yep. Yep. Um, anybody could have done this. I think that's the crazy thing, and that's probably, like I said, that was their undoing because they got lazy. So in the beginning, they had the best intentions: take the barrels, fill them up, bring them back, make it look like it, it all, it's all as it should be. No one ever checks. It gets checked once a year. And at, at the most, they're just checking to make sure everything's in order. They're not testing the syrup because the syrup's already been tested before it ends up in the reserve warehouse. Mm. And, then, and then, again, I feel like this is so Canadian. The lake froze over. Because, <laughs> <laughs> of course, it did. Because <laughs> so, so <now> <laughs> it's Canada. <laughs> that's right. So now the lake's frozen. Yeah. <laughs> They, oh, they, they no longer have access to the fresh water to fill up the barrels. They just basically figure, screw it, we'll just take the syrup. Like this mm. warehouse is, there's hundreds and thousands of barrels. Who's going to notice? Um, so they just start draining barrels of syrup in the reserve warehouse and just leaving empty barrels laying around, basically. Wonder how. So how did they transport the syrup they drained, does it say? Well, they drained it from... The, the federation's barrels into their own barrels so they got their own barrels yeah they had their own barrels in the back of the cutting, truck cutting cutting into your into your profits by uh, you know your overheads are now going up terrible business model no they always they always had their own barrels that was the oh, thing okay. they had to get them out of the federation's barrels to avoid any suspicion of course yeah actually yep. good point yep uh, but now now they're actually saving money because they're not they're not bothering <laughs> going down to their shack anymore <laughs> you know time is money they can just drain it right there on the spot they got one security guard to contend with which was probably someone they paid off anyways to look the other way mm-hmm. um and this is this is what i said earlier this could have worked really really well for them if they just put a little bit of effort in um yeah but that once a year audit comes around and there's a little bit of conflicting information on to whether it was the yearly audit or if someone who wasn't being paid enough tipped off uh, the federation but regardless they were going to be doing this yearly audit anyways and the guy comes in and like i said earlier he finds these empty barrels these damaged barrels these rusted barrels these water filled barrels they're kind of begging to be caught yeah yeah um, and that's basically what happens he goes in the, the cops get involved it becomes one of the biggest things in canadian history in terms of police work it's all over the news um it probably doesn't help them that this guy we're calling Saint Pierre was one of the biggest dealers of syrup outside of the Federation. So he was one of the first places they went and sure enough they found a ton of the Federation's syrup. There you go. Backtrack it, they they catch up with Sebastian, the truck driver, who was apparently more than happy to roll on everyone um, <laughs> <laughs> and give everyone up. So they've got they've got all their guys arrested on trial um and as i finish this story i think one of the best things about it again i can't believe it because it's canadian and i just don't imagine canadian people ever speak like this Mm. you've got richard the the barrel roller and you've got a vic the guy with the warehouse so richard's richard's the guy who made the most money out of it he ended up netting close to 1.5 million dollars worth of income or profit after he sold all the maple syrup Wow, did all right. 
So he was um, he was probably the best off for it. So he was heavily in the spotlight when this was going to trial and everyone was, you know, trying to work out who was involved and how much was taken and all that type of gear. But he then went on to, his defense was mounted that he, he didn't want to do this. No. no. <laughs> he was, he was forced into this uh, mm. because of Vic with his connections to the mafia threatened to kill him and his family if he didn't help him sell the stolen syrup. <laughs> <laughs> wow, that obviously didn't float. No, well, it so couldn't have floated. The lake was frozen over, but it, it didn't really work for any of them. So no, they all ended up in, you know, in a bit of a sticky situation. <laughs> Funny, good, well done, <laughs> well done, good work. Yeah, and they were all. Did you write that one? Did you write that joke down? Yeah, I did. Yeah, no, yeah, okay, good work. <laughs> nice, nice. You know, like I yeah. said, the jokes kind of write themselves with this one. <laughs> um, <laughs> so they all ended up. Again, forget this, forget for a moment that it's maple syrup. This is a serious crime. Um, they were all charged, the four of them, these four main... Oh, sorry, the three main guys were Richard, Avic, and, and Sebastian, the, the truck driver. Um, St. Pierre was never charged with anything, but his business was essentially dismantled through the investigation. Sebastian was charged with trafficking stolen goods, and he was sentenced to eight months in jail. Richard was charged with fraud trafficking in stolen goods and theft he was put in jail for eight years with a 9.4 million dollar fine mm-hmm. and a vic was sentenced to five years in prison with a 2.2 million dollar fine seems fair so you know the canadians don't mess around it's we're having a laugh it's all fun and games but it is a serious crime um mm-hmm. and i think it's yeah. just it's the, the comedic aspect of it is because it's maple syrup. Yeah, that's right. Um, did anything change? Did like did that force change in the federation rules or the or the cartels' grip on maple syrup, or has anything changed as a result of this? Um, there's recently there's been a lot of call for the government to step in and to basically adjust the way the federation operates so that people aren't so. I guess hamstrung by the the cartel by the federation yeah because there was a ton of media spin on this story how yes these guys did it because they they wanted to make money you know that's yeah i would say what 99.9 percent of crime is motivated by yeah um but the 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 subplot to it all was this was a chance to stick it to the man and stick it to the federation because Mm. you know they've put people in this position where they can't operate on their own accord and they've got to abide by all these rules but who knows i'd probably say it's more the money yeah fair enough too that's it that's the story that's the great canadian maple syrup ice thank you for taking the time to listen stick around next week we've got phil knight and the story of nike again for dropping in. We hope you'll we'll make this a weekly visit. And hope we Bring the family home. You've enjoyed your evening as much as we've enjoyed Please having you here. Carefully and come back again soon. Good night. Good night now. Good night.